difficult times arise, I let my anger always get the best of me. The only way I the only way I know is to get mad and fight. But I am tired of fighting. But is but it is the only way I know. It all began at an early age in middle school. I remember talking with my friends at the lunchroom about my situations and my grades and how much I hated my parents. One of my friends had told me, told me to down a bottle and it would make all the pain go away and I wouldn't care about all that stuff anymore. They were right for a little while. No one knows how I feel inside. No one understands the pain inside. I can't live with all this pain inside. I know my parents will never understand how I'm feeling. <laughs> this is the only way I can let the pain inside out. As I begin to feel overwhelmed, I go to my quiet place and open up my Bible. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. This is the holy day of the Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. We are going to fight this battle with the word of God, which is our sword. That is how we are going to fight this battle. I fight my battle with prayer and intercession. As I begin to feel overwhelmed by the things of this world, I begin to pray about my situations. I know in Matthew 18, 20, it says, For where two or three are gather gathered in my name, their God is in the midst of them. <coughs> Lord, you say in Matthew 7, 7, To ask and it will be given to you. To seek and you will find. Knock on the door and it will be opened to you. So we pray right now for these chains to be broken off. fight my battles with praise and worship. As I feel overwhelmed, I turn on worship music and praise my way out of these feelings. I, I know in Acts 16, Paul and Silas were in prison, and they began to praise the Lord so loud that their chains broke off and the walls of the prison fell down. Let's pray right now that your chains will be broke. That was a, um, <clears throat> I was praying about this service and wanted to get the kids involved and I just started to see the, the battles that we fight on a daily basis and there's more battles, you know, it's not just anger and self-harm and drugs and alcohol, but those three just really popped to my mind and I don't know if it's, it's just because it was for somebody here today, you know, um, I really believe that he orchestrate, he gave me the words and gave me the, the, you know, those are the main ways that we fight our battle with the Lord is by prayer, intercession, praise, and worship in the yeah. Word of God. Right. And so I just wanted to bless you with that today right. and just know that, you know, as we are downstairs, that's what we're doing. We're teaching them at an early age that they don't have to fight their battles with, with the things of the world. They don't have to fight their battles with the drugs and the alcohol or the anger or the self-harm, that they can fight their battles with the Lord. And they're going to learn that at an early age, and their foundation is going to be strong. Amen. Thank you. Guess y'all figured out what the service is going to be about. How we fight our battles. Letting go of things. You know, it's hard sometimes to let go of things that you're carrying. It's, it's, it's hard to not want to 
bow up and fight. I get Jacob's sign because that was me. I just wanted to fight. Get angry over the smallest little things. You get your feelings hurt. And then you carry that. You get upset, you get angry, and it just starts to escalate and escalate. And it starts to become just normal. It starts to become normal and okay behavior in your mind. Because I never knew where to fight my battles. I wanted to fight toe-to-toe right here on the ground. That's where I was taught my battles were fought at. Or we have it in our mind that be a man, suck it up. You never know what people are carrying. You never know the things that, that the person right beside you is holding on to. You never know what they're carrying that's weighing them down. That's difficult to go from point A to point B when you're so heavily burdened with stuff that you just don't realize all you've got to do is let go of it. How simple it is, but yet how so difficult it actually is to step into that. So we're going to talk about changing your battleground. You know, I was reading, reading an article, reading a post that I saw about an eagle and a snake. An eagle swoops down and picks up a big snake. Rattlesnake, whatever kind of snake. All snakes are bad snakes, so it doesn't really matter. A snake's a snake, okay? You know, a snake, a snake's best friend is a hoe, okay? And if any of y'all don't know what a hoe is, ask somebody next to you. Somebody's going to know, okay? That's, so you got an eagle and a snake. That eagle will swoop down, grasp that snake, deadly snake. All it takes is one bite takes that snake off the ground into the into the air, into the sky, where it's helpless. Snake's completely helpless in the sky. It can't bite. It can't do nothing. It's helpless. And that, sna- that eagle lets it go. He lets go of it. And it slams back down into the earth, stunned, whatever, dead. Then the eagle swoops in and devours it. That eagle's smart enough not to fight that snake on the ground because it'll lose. That eagle will lose on the ground when he fights that battle, fights that snake. But he knows that if he takes it up into the sky, into the spiritual realm, okay, he takes that snake up into the spiritual realm and lets go of it. And when he lets go of it, it's, it dies. It's gone. Then he devours it. So all those years, I was fighting my battles toe-to-toe on the ground, trying to figure it all out myself. All I had to do was just spread my wings and just let go of it. And then once I let go of it, it it's, it's devoured. It's gone. It's not a part of me anymore. And that's, that eagle will do that every single time. It won't ever try to fight one on the ground. Animals are smarter than me. A bird's got it figured out. A bird's got life figured out. A bird has got a spiritual life figured out better than I did. Because I keep wanting to go back and go back. And go back. Why can't I just be an eagle? You know? And swoop down. There's my my attacker. There's my problem. I'm going to swoop down and take you where you can't hurt me. I'm going to let you go. And then I'm going to pop you right in the head when I come down. It's over with. It's done. That's how our battles... The battle is not fought when that eagle comes back down 
and devours that. The battle is won when it lets go. That's when the battle gets won, when he lets go. We talk about this kind of stuff with the youth all the time. We, we have services downstairs. We try to let the Holy Spirit just completely take control. And I don't stand still downstairs either, so y'all just bear with me. We, we let the, try to let the Holy Spirit teach the kids what he wants them to know. And for a long time, I did it the wrong way. It was what I wanted to teach the kids and what we wanted the kids to know. And when the Lord told me one day, he said, son, I got this. I said, okay. And he's had it ever since. Because I had to let go of some things. Control. Pride. I'm the youth pastor. I'm going to decide what we talk about. No. That don't go well. Real, it, it, that doesn't go well. I wanted to do things how I wanted to. I wanted my vision of the youth to transpire. I wanted to... I, I, wanted to, I had my picture that I drew of what I thought our youth should be. God said, no. I've already drawn the picture. It's a Picasso. It's a Rembrandt. God said, I've already got it drawn out perfectly. What I need you to do is just love me and love them and be faithful. That's all he told me he needs me to be. Love him, love them, and be faithful. Faithful that he's going to provide. I can't do the things that I do downstairs without help. From the kids, from other adults, from him. You know, Lindsay Rock said, I don't have to worry about the music and the praise and the worship. You know, y'all, as y'all seen, you've seen these kids begin to lift their arms and want prayer. And you've seen kids fall out in the Holy Spirit that they want more. This is the worship that we experience every service we have with our kids. Your kids are downstairs doing the things that they saw you do. Good and bad. There's an aha moment. They're downstairs doing the things that they saw their mother and their fathers and their brothers and the sisters do. Whether it's good things or whether it's bad things. Your children are watching you. They may not admit it. But they're watching and paying attention to you. What you do, right or wrong, has become normal to them. The youth that you saw scattered up here today, this is the future leaders of Freedom Tabernacle. But they're the church of today for Freedom Tabernacle. So I want them to understand how to fight their battles. And where to fight their battles at? 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. Good job, Leah. I got Leah, I've got Raven in the back. As part of our youth downstairs, they're involved today. And I just, I wanted to recognize them and, 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 all, and all that. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. How do we fight our battles? We fight our battles in a spiritual realm with God. We allow Him to actually do the fighting. All we have to do is let go of the things that we're dealing with in our life. We don't fight the enemy in his comfort zone. The devil is a liar. He comes to steal, to kill, to destroy, to consume. He's walking among us every day. He's there. He's slithering through 
in his comfort zone, in his world, on his ground, in his territory. We don't fight him there. We take him completely out of his comfort zone and we take him out. Just like the eagle. Just like what it does to the snake. It, it applies, that story applies to us every day. It applies to me every day on how to fight and, 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 do my, and, and fight my battles. And I like to use those little, those little scenarios, those little vision type visions that, that can help our youth kind of get it. Because I'm a vision type person. Sometimes hearing it, I don't get it. But if I can see a picture, I can get it. An eagle swooping down, picking up a snake, dropping it in the air, in the air and dropping it on the ground. That resonates with me. That's things that I can hold on to. And I thought, how do I fight my battles? What do I do? What do I use? I like to shoot. I like guns. I like to hunt. Everybody that shot a gun has, has had one misfire, had something mess up at some point or time. I thought, okay, how am I going to fight my battles? Toe-to-toe -to -toe or in the air? And you read through Ephesians, it talks about the, the armor of God and what He's given us as far as our armor goes. But I thought, Lord, I said, I really want, I, I want, a, I want a vision of somebody using the right armor, the right warfare, the right... Uh, artillery, whatever it may be. I want to understand. And God said, David. And I thought about the giant, Goliath. In 1 Samuel 17, 38 and 39. So Saul clothed David with his armor. And he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. And I started thinking about the story of David and, and Goliath and what happened. Da David was a young man, a young boy, 14, 15 years old, somewhere in that ballpark. Little guy, inexperienced. He was carrying lunch to his brothers that were fighting a battle. He was a little shepherd boy. But he knew that Saul's armor, all this stuff, was not going to be sufficient to fight his battle. He knew that. He came in the name of the Lord, was, was first off, so David came in the, in, in the name of the Lord. When he did that, nothing else he had to do. Just coming in the name of the Lord, he just defeated that giant. It wasn't the slingshot. It wasn't the rocks. It was the fact that he came in the name of the Lord. He immediately won that battle. I have shot a slingshot. It hurts when they hit you right here. Most, a lot of you don't know what I'm talking about, but they hurt. You ever made a miss lick and then the rock hits you right here and you get the little, the little blood blister that pops up? They hurt. And you, I couldn't hit that wall with one. So how is he going to take a rock and sling it and hit a giant in the head? He, he didn't. He didn't. His faith in God, he knew what was going to happen because he used what he knew he had to. He knew that that physical armor, the physical stuff that he was given, he knew was not going to be worth anything. He had to fight in the spiritual realm to be able to get it and to be able to win. And when he did and he took that step, he made that step. All the times in my life that I never understood how to fight my battles, when I laid in a bed and didn't know whether I wanted to get up or not, when I was trying to fight and argue and cry and try to just get out and run. And, and, and some of y'all have heard my story before to the point where I stood or sat in a field with the gun in my mouth and pulled the trigger. And it clicked. I went to do it again. And my phone rang. I was trying to fight my battles with 
the only armor and artillery that I knew I could win with. I chose to fight my battles that way because I had no idea there was another way. Had no, no idea. Nobody had ever told me there was another way. I was angry because God wouldn't take in my problems and taking my pain and taking my, my chains and getting rid of them. I'm praying, I'm thanking God, I'm believing that everything's okay, yet I'm still running into a wall every time I turn around. Everything I touched was just turning to junk. Has anybody ever been there? To where it seems like everything you do is blowing up in your face. No matter how much you pray, how much you believe, how much faith you've got, you stand there and you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray and, you pray and nothing happens. Or is it just me? Once I finally realized, hey, I've got to do this. God's got to be, I use this example for the kids. You've got a big bucket that you're carrying all kind of rocks and junk in. And you're carrying those things around or you're carrying chains around you. But you've got your hands full of stuff. You've got it full of fear and anger and doubt and self-hatred and bitterness, and rage, and pride, and you're carrying all this stuff in your hand, and you're trying to stand up, and you're trying to preach and speak to people with all these things that you're carrying. You're trying to lead your household with all this stuff that you're carrying. You're trying to stand at work. You're trying to stand at school. You're trying to get stuff done with all the things that you're carrying around in your hand, and God's standing right in front of you trying to hand you a gift, trying to give you a blessing, and you're trying to figure out why God's not give you anything yet, and He's standing right in front of you, and all you've got to do is eventually let go of the junk that's in your hand so that he can put something else in it. If I'm carrying my buckets around full of junk and there's tons and tons of things right here, money piled in the floor, and God said, here, you can have all of that. I've got to empty my buckets before I've got something to put in it. So that's the life that we live. That's the life that I was leaving, le leading. That's what our youth are being taught downstairs, that you've got to clean out your closet. You've got to get rid of the things that you're carrying around inside so that God's got room to put something good in there. It's simple to me now. But it's still difficult sometimes to walk in that because I carried so much junk for so long. When I realized that physical weapons fail, I knew that the only thing that I had was my God. When people, as much as I love everybody in here, y'all are going to let me down. I'm going to let you down. That's our human nature. People will let people down. My God has never, ever let me down in my entire life. And He will never let me down. I may not get my way every time. I may not get what I want every time, but I'll get what I need on time every time. I believe that. I, am, I told them a couple weeks ago, I'm so sick and tired of being sick and tired that I can't stand it anymore. Sick and tired of being sick and tired of carrying things. People think, Pastor, your pastors have got it made. You know, I may stand up here and walk, but I'm still carrying things. You know, there's rocks that I carry in my pocket that I've got, that I'm dealing with, problems that I have, that I carry with me, and I don't know what to do but to throw them down and let them go, to, let, to get rid of it. Because carrying these things around makes things heavy. It starts to hinder you. It starts to hinder what you've got. I don't want to stand up in front of the youth downstairs with all these things bogging me down and trying to be a light for them and let God use me. I want to clear all my stuff up. But what do we do? Here's, here's what I did for years. I carried my rocks. I'd have them hid. Nobody knew about them. Nobody knew about them. But instead of letting go of them, I'd throw them at somebody. I'd take my rocks and I'd throw them at people. I'd try to make somebody else. You're going to understand how I feel. I want you to understand, I'm hurting. I'm, I, I'm hurting, Tony. I hurt like I'm the only one that ever hurts. I need prayer, but I'm too prideful to say, man, Tony, I need you to pray for me. I think I've done gone too far and too deep in my life. I'm a pastor. I don't need you to pray for me. What do you need me to pray for you for? When I got my, to the point where my battles were my battles, 
And if they were my battles, it was my choice. I chose to keep those as a battle instead of just letting it go. But I'd want to lay them down. Lord, I'm going to lay all this down for you. But I'd go back and pick them up. I'd come down and kneel down on my face and I'd pray, Lord, I need to get rid of this. I don't want to carry this anymore. And then when I'd leave and nobody was looking, I'd stick it back in my pocket. And I'd leave. Those are the things that I had to learn and that I had to deal with. Where I realized the number one weapon in my arsenal, the number one weapon is my prayer. When I pray, the devil trembles. Wonders happen and God hears. That's my number one weapon is I pray. Because I know when I pray and I speak the name of Jesus, it's over with. That's lights out. That's a mic drop moment. Because the power, now listen, if you're taking notes, you want to take notes, you want to write this down. The power that moves the hand that controls the world is power, is prayer. The power that moves the hand that controls the world is prayer. You, when God said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee a great and mighty things that they know us not. God already knows everything. He's got my problems already situated. But yet I want to keep dragging them in and out because I want you to hear my chains rattle. I want you to know that I'm dealing with something. I want you to know how bad it is for me. I want to get your pity patty sob story because I want you to think, what, what poor old Todd, poor pitiful me. When all I need to do is just let go of my problems, quit dragging my rattling chains. You never know who's going to be among you that's carrying chains in their life that just needs a little help, that just needs to be told, hey, just let go of them. Drop the chains down and walk away from it. You never know what pastors that you've got, what youth leaders that you've got, people that's walking among you carrying chains wrapped around their necks, Bogging them down from drugs, from alcohol, from different types of things that they're dealing with. And they're carrying the weight of these chains around their neck. And they can't make it another step without somebody giving them a little word to know, hey, take this to the spiritual level, give it back to God and let Him have it all and He'll release all this. Sometimes people can't let go of it on their own. Sometimes people need help. Sometimes people need a little word to get these chains off of them. Sometimes we've got to pitch in. We've got to help because people are getting drugged down. They're getting brought to their knees where they can't do it anymore. They're carrying doubt. They're carrying fear. They're carrying, now this is real for Marcus. Marcus isn't here putting this on. He's hurt and he's struggled in his life with different things. He is broken down and he wants to let go of each and everything that he's carried in his life. Marcus understands that these chains are broken. They were symbolic of what we were trying to show this morning. But he also knows these are drugs. These are fear. These are anger. These are things that he's dropping. And he's going to start walking his life the way that God would have him to walk his life instead of worrying about these chains anymore. Because these chains do nothing but break you down, drag you down, slow you down. They will absolutely destroy your life the longer that you carry them. It's not the sin itself that destroys you. It's the weight of that sin that will destroy your life. We've got to be willing to let go of it and walk away from it. And never... Don't you pick that back up. That chain's gone, brother. We've got to let go of the worldly things that are holding us down. Here's me. Here's my story. Fear, anger, doubt, embarrassment, and self-conscious. Every one of those. Fearful of the unknown. Anger at everything. Doubt in who I was. Embarrassment for what I'd done. Self-conscious for how I looked. Yeah, I'm going there. <laughs> 70. Uh, here, here's a, a, a battle in a demon I've been fighting for a long time. 
I would get angry. I would eat. A lot. So I get people with eating disorders. There's the ones where you eat and then you throw up. There's the ones that you just don't eat enough. Then there's the ones that you just completely cram your gut full of food and you think it just makes it all go away. 78 days ago, I was 302 pounds. I said, Lord, there's got to be a change. I said, there's got to be a change. This morning, I was 253. My desire was to get healthy. A circumstance to fuel my desire was not walking my daughter down the aisle in a few weeks as big as I was. So it took something, an outside interference, an outside something physical, something out here to fuel something in me. So I fought that battle. That was one of my rocks I threw. My anger, I fought that battle. Some of these battles are ongoing because of what we run into every day. I have to bite my tongue. Or when I do mess up, which happens occasionally. Has anybody ever like that? Just occasionally you mess up? Ever now and then? Are we all in here too good and we're going to say we never mess up? I mess up hourly. Because I'm not worshiping God enough. I mess up hourly. When God says, hey, talk to me a second. Or, hey, Todd, listen to this. I'm like, no, I got a, I got a phone call I got to make. God has changed my life. He's changed me. I'm learning how to fight my battles. I'm learning where to fight my battles. But David was a young boy that had it figured out. If you notice these youth down here with their hands raised, praising. I didn't notice all of y'all with your hands raised, praising. Who are they seeing it from? I see them praying, putting their arms around each other. Why do we miss that part as adults? Because it's not cool to go put your arm around another man and tell him you love him. That's our mentality. Sometimes it takes somebody else to help you fight your battle. Sometimes you need your boy to get you back. Tony, man, get my back because I'm about to dive in. And if he starts whooping on me, jump in. But give me just a minute. Don't jump in too quick. You, you got to have your boy. To, you got to have somebody to get you back. God's always back behind me. He's always back behind me. But then sometimes I wonder who's in front of me. If he's got my back, then who's clearing the road? That's where the Holy Ghost comes in. He's got my path cleared. As long as I make that right choice, then it's all okay. But thinking about David, how he had so much faith to say, I got this. He had that little man syndrome. Everybody knows how the little people like to do this and then look for the big guy to help them. Okay? That's what happens. That's what happens. The little bitty guys get you in trouble, and then the big guys got, they get in trouble, and the big guys got to get them out of it. But David, wasn't, he didn't have that mentality. David had the mentality of like, hey, I've got God. I'm about to go in Jesus' name, and I'm about to take old big boy out. He had zero doubt. Zero. You know what that much doubt does? Takes away your blessing takes away that much doubt you know it takes this much faith is all we need well that's all the doubt that you need to not get your blessing or your healing or your th or your gift or whatever you're asking for in your life it takes that much just to open a door and when that door of doubt is open then all of a sudden it gets from doubt and it gets to fear and it's Lord oh why me why me why can't I get what I want one of my problems in fighting my battles was knowing about God. Now hear me right. One of my problems in fighting my battles was knowing about God. I'll give y'all just a second. I think he's lost his mind. 
Knowing about God was one of my problems. You know why? I knew about him. But I didn't know him. I didn't know him in the powerful, intimate, loving way that I should. I was saved and I was called to preach. Yet I had no idea who my God really was. I just knew about him. I knew what I'd heard. I knew what had been told to me. I knew what I had read. But I didn't know who he was. And once I realized who he was, it was a game changer. It was a game changer when I realized who God really, really was. He's my everything. He's my all in all. He's my answer. He's my solution. He's the best friend I've got. He's everything that I need in my life. He is. Yet we simply worship. We simply worship our idea of God. Not God himself. We worship our idea of what God is. Not what he actually is himself. I was reading a book, A.W. Tozer, and he said this was called entertaining thoughts about God that really aren't worthy of him. So do we worship our idea of God or do we worship who God really is? Because we fight our battles with our worship. That's how we fight our battles. That's how these kids destroy the battles and the things in their life that they're dealing with. That they come down and tell us and they talk about it and they want prayer on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights. These youth, our youth, they're fighting battles. But they know, here's the thing that's so cool about it. They know where to go. They know where to come to. They know what to say. They know what to believe. And they come up tears streaming with all they've got. I don't want to deal with this anymore. They know where to go. I live most of my life misunderstanding what God's heart was for me. I thought he was the hand slapping, pulpit popping, slap me upside the head when I get in trouble kind of God. He's holding a club, and every time I mess up, he's smacking me in the back of the head with it. That was my idea of God. When you mess up, you're going straight to hell where you stand. That was my idea of God. That's what I was scared of. He wasn't giving me what I wanted. I got what I deserved because of the decisions that I made. But God walked through it with me. He stood with me. I told everybody, I went to court alone. Yeah, court, for those that ain't heard. I went to court alone for sentencing. Yeah, y'all heard that right too. Sentencing. Did. For stupid decisions 10 years ago. Had people kick me out of a church, didn't want me in a church I was in. Yanked my letter. Y'all know, y'all know what a letter is, Robbie does. <laughs> We're going to open the door shortly for the exception of members under three headings. Okay? That's not meant to offend anybody, so I don't want to get offended by me saying that. I'm just, you know. Those are things that were taken from me. You don't have that piece of paper that says I'm an ordained pastor. That don't mean nothing to me. Don't mean anything. I stood, I told everybody, I said, I stood alone. Nobody came. I could have not come home. I had nobody standing beside me. You think that'll change your life? Stand before a judge by yourself with your life on the line. Could have been 20 years. Four. Five apiece. Do the math. Could have been 20 years. I walked out scot-free. Two years probation. A 
a lot of things said and blamed that I did. A lot of things said and blamed that I didn't do. You're talking about a pocket full of rocks. I was fine with the dumb mistake I made. But I was so angry at the stuff that I didn't do. And I was so angry at the people that were talking about me and making up the lies and stuff that I didn't do. I was angry. I carried something in my wallet for two years that said that stuff was not true. But I stood alone, or so I thought. God had a different plan for me to change my life and put me back where I need to be. My record's clear. Been clear for a long time. But none of that matters. Because when I said, Lord, please forgive me, it was gone. Now, I didn't walk in that. I didn't walk in that. I didn't want to leave my house. I didn't want to go to the store. I didn't want to go anywhere. I was still trying to fight my battles by throwing rocks at other people that were, that were against me. Taking things from me. Until God one day it just felt like he picked me up and shook me. And I said, God, I want, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. And if you'll walk with me, we'll figure this thing out. And it took a while. Because my, my pockets, it was getting heavy. It was hard to walk. Because I had so many rocks in my pocket. I was throwing stuff at people. But yet I was still trying to get God to help me. I hadn't figured out where to fight my battles yet. I was still trying to go toe to toe. He wanted to give me so much. But I hadn't let go of the junk, the, any of the junk yet. I was still carrying it. The guilt. 1 John 1, 9 says, We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. From all unrighteousness. Don't matter what I did, what you did. A sin's a sin. It's either hot or cold. It's either black or white. He'll spew the warm stuff out of his mouth. Because he ain't got no need for it. I was too worried about people judging me for who I was. Where I should have been focused on is what people were seeing what I am. I want to be able... And this is something that each and every one of us can do. We should walk into a room. We should be able to walk into a room. Not open our mouth, John Paul. And people feel the Holy Spirit immediately. Just by us walking into a room. Not even have to open your mouth. You walk in and somebody just hit the floor and just feel it all over them. That's how we should walk. We should walk in that faith. We should be able to do that. But to do that, you've got to let go of everything else you're carrying. It doesn't matter what you've been through in your life, whether you've been arrested, whether you've been on drugs, whether you've done this, whether you've done that, whether you're divorced, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether whatever the case in your life may be, there's no excuse for not being able to carry the Holy Ghost with you from place to place to place to place to place. Just like they said, there's no junior Holy Ghost. So when these kids come in here, y'all better get your head, hands and feet inside the vehicle because it's going to be a heck of a ride. These kids, there's, there's no junior Holy Ghost. There, there's not. We put a damper on that stuff sometimes. We think we've got excuses and problems in our lives and we carry this or we carry fear. We carry anxiety. Let go of it. We're going to have an opportunity later for you to come up and let go of some things. But God has been working with me on different things and, and, and trying to step out into gifts and things that He's showing me. But it's not about me. It's about me giving a word to somebody that needs to hear that word. That God uses us to give somebody else a word. I just had to walk up to somebody during praise and worship and say thank you for being you. I 
I felt in my spirit to walk up to somebody and say, God said to you, you already won your battle. You've already won it. If people has a word for me, I want to hear it. I want to know. Because I need help too. Things that my issue was with my guilt is I felt like I deserved it. Anybody ever like that? You feel like you deserve it? God's still mad because I'm still suffering. He must not forgive me yet. But you know what it all boils down to is the, the third one. I just couldn't forgive myself. I couldn't forgive me. God hung on a cross. When he hung and bled on that cross, it covered every stupid mistake I'd ever make. There's enough blood right there that covers every mistake, every decision, everything that you would ever do or think about doing or your family and generation, generation all the way down. It covered every bit of it. So the problem is not why is God mad at me because I'm still suffering. You're still suffering because you're still sitting there with your foot on the gas in that much mud and you're not going anywhere because you've not forgiven yourself. Once you take that rock out of your pocket and say, I forgive myself, I'm done with this, and let go of it, then and only then will you be able to start experiencing the blessings God's got for you. But we want to beat ourselves up. Five years of my life, I lost because of keeping all my stuff bottled up. That I missed because of anger, because of fear. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance that leads to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. I wanted everybody else to be sorry for me. And this is the way God showed that to me. I wanted everybody else to feel sorry for me and what I went through. I didn't want nobody to be angry at me. Don't you be mad at me for what I did. Tell my wife, don't you be mad at me. You just feel sorry for me. I couldn't accept the fact that hey, I'd screwed up. I'd messed up. I had had a battle. And my battle continued because I was trying to use things of the world. It went from this to this to this to this to this to, uh-oh, what do I do now? Had I used the things of the world or, or the things of the, of, of the spiritual room and took my battle where it should be, it would have been different. This past week, somebody that was involved in, in the situation with me, they weren't involved. They're one of the ones I did wrong to. Oh, a couple weeks ago. He hit me up on Facebook. Man, Facebook is just a bad little dude sometimes. He hits me up on Facebook. Wants to be my friend. I'm like, oh, heck no. <laughs> Delete. <laughs> nope. Not going to happen. Don't nobody think that if you've befriended me, I've deleted you. Most of the time I just leave them in and don't pay attention to it. But this one I saw and I quickly deleted. But like, no. And this guy was a great friend of mine. We went through a lot of battles with the fire department, a lot of things together. It was a good friend of mine that I wronged. But I deleted it. I'm like, yeah, nope, not going to do it. Then I talked to another friend of mine. I told him what happened. He goes, that was stupid. <laughs> kind of how guys talk to each other sometimes. He goes, that was stupid. I know. But why would you do that? I don't know. His comment was, what did he do to you? Like, Man, shut up. Click. <laughs> just immediately knew that. I mean, just hit me right in the face. What did he do to you? So I go back on Facebook. <laughs> Friend request him. And there's a little, you can put a memo with it. You can send a message. <coughs> sorry. I said, man, look, I got your first friend request, and I deleted it. I'm sorry. <coughs> And then I explained, you know, just talked to him a second. 
And I said, hey, I said, if you want to meet for lunch or something one day, I said, I'll, I'll meet you and I'll answer any questions that you got. I said, I, I, I love you. I miss you guys. I'm thinking, I, I, I hit sand. I'm thinking, Lord, please don't let me get it. Please don't let me get it. <laughs> a week, a week goes by. I get a response back. That sounds good. I'm like, oh. Y'all ever do something and think, why did I do that? Okay, so I start scratching my head thinking, okay, this is the battle I've got to fight. I've got to, I've got to face this. Got to do it. Got to do it. So I put my phone number on there. And I thought I'd put the wrong one, but I didn't. I put my phone number. <laughs> so I put my phone on there. About 10 minutes, my phone run. I look down and I'm like, well, I don't know that number, but I kind of know who that is. Y'all ever been there? It's like, yeah, that's just a gift that you don't want at the time. <laughs> kind of knew who that was. Answered the phone. I said, uh, hello. <laughs> he said, hey. I'm thinking, oh, no. Just didn't sound good. We talked. We decided to meet for lunch. Oh, I was sick. I didn't feel good. Just like instantly, like, oh, I'm going to throw up. I don't need to go eat. It's going to be miserable. So I started trying to deal with it on the flesh. Like, okay, I'm calling a couple customers. Hey, we, I can get a crew to you. We can get started early, or we can do this, or is there anything you need? I literally start trying to find a way to say, hey, man, I can't get there. Work's come up. Got to go, got to go, got to go. Yeah, they couldn't see me yet either. So, so I kind of said, okay, I'll meet you at, you know, 11.30 at Tacos and Tequilas. I'm not a drinker in any way, shape, or form. I, I, I could have had a few that day. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So we went and ate uh, uh, tacos, tequilas. And I, I get there, and I walk in the door, and I think, he ain't saw me in a long time. Maybe he won't recognize me. <laughs> I could say, hey, I didn't see you, man. I had to go. <laughs> I'm still using excuse after excuse after excuse to try to cover me up to try to get rid of that to try to put it back off just to throw a rock towards somebody else and I was trying to find every angle I could to be able to leave and not face what I needed to face to not deal with my issue to not fight my battle I was trying to just forget about it again and bury it and hide it I was digging a hole to cover up a hole that I was in. And when I turned around, all that was there was another hole. So I was digging and digging and digging and digging. And oh, it's covered up and I'm good. And it's uh, okay, I can't step there. Because I've just created another mess. So I said, you know, and I seen him sitting there. I said, you know, Lord, here we go. I just dug in. He stands up. I kind of get sideways because I don't know what he's about to do. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, truth, truth. I mean, it, it, he's not coming open arms. He, he stands up and he's a grown boy. He, he's grown. It was, I was going to need Tony's help. So I, he stands up and I, I'm thinking, okay. And then, and then he hugs me. And I start crying. And uh, I say, man, I'm sorry. I said, I, I was in a bad place and I'm not that man anymore. No. No. So I'm standing in tacos and tequilas crying. People looking at me. <laughs> he crying. People still looking. Waiter standing there. <laughs> asking what we want to drink. Oh. <laughs> but it ends in a good meal. We're going to go riding. Here's what it ended in. God, no, not only help me get rid of a stone that I've been carrying. He gave me a friend back. He gave me somebody back. Even though I wronged, he stood in front of me eat. He sat down. He said, I don't care about all that. I'm just glad you're in a better place. Amen. 
And so when I decided to dump out my pockets where there was nothing in them at all, he showed up. But he didn't show up till I let go. We got to take our storms and take our battles and use them. And I'm going to end on this and I'm going to have start play another eagle story an eagle and y'all might have seen a post if you're a friend of mine I bet I get a bunch of friend requests after today <laughs> that's a marketing ploy no an eagle during a storm flies up he don't go hide in a nest he don't hide in a hole an eagle flies up to its peak to where it stays that up in the trees up high when the storms and the wind starts to blow, that eagle spreads its wings and begins to flap its wings. And he lets that wind carry it up above the storm. So while that storm is raging below, that eagle is just peacefully soaring up above it, above the storm. So whatever storm you're in in your life, Whatever storm it is, just spread your wings. Just spread your wings. Just spread your wings and fly. And let the wind or that Holy Ghost, let it just lift you up above your storm, above your situation, and you'll just be able to glide. And it's quiet way up high. That eagle can't even hear what's going on down below. Has no idea. Because it's just peaceful. Here's what we have to do. Let go of what you're carrying. And use your storm. Let go of what you're carrying. And use your storm. And he'll change your life. I got some of my youth that are coming down as prayer partners. Y'all come on. The ones I've talked to. But these are youth. I'm going to try. Normally you see a youth with an adult prayer partner. No. These can stand alone. My other adult that helps me, y'all come on up too. Our youth can stand alone in prayer. And here's the key that I figured out that, that God showed me. Their prayers are just as powerful as ours. But sometimes, God don't hear them for He will us. Because they've not had all the stuff to defile their minds. And Jill just said it. They're pure. Something that Shelly said in a prayer downstairs really lit me up and I believe it's about to happen like literally about to happen those that are normally prayer partners I didn't yank you out because I don't love you I want you to have the opportunity to be ministered to as well if you've never been blessed and you want to get a hold of something good come let one of these kids get a hold of you Raven you want to come pray too I feel like asking you to come down here and pray we got a slew of them up here. Don't leave one standing by themselves. If you leave here carrying something, it's your own fault. But what Shelly said, she said, Holy Spirit, I want you to hijack this service. To hijack this service. I want the doors to blow off. And I want the service, the whole thing completely hijacked by the Holy Ghost. A Holy Ghost hijacking. There's a sermon in that. There's a sermon in Holy Ghost hijacking. I wish he'd have hijacked me a long time ago. I wish I had that opportunity. Regardless of what you need to pray for, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, oh, we want to pray for that. We're going to fix that. 
If you've never been filled with the Holy Ghost, oh, we got you covered too. We got all that. If you're praying for healing in your life, if you're praying for healing for a family member, if you're praying for situations, whatever it is that you've got, whatever burden's holding you down, lay your rock up here on the altar and just leave it here. Just let go of it. 